Chapter Thirteen of the Exploits of Juve by Marcella Lane and Pierre Suvestra. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen: Robbery, American Fashion. Tickets, please. The guard took the one offered by Fandor. Excuse me, sir. There has been a mistake here. He said, "This train doesn't go to Marseilles." The train, yes, but not the last carriage of which you are, for it is bound for Pontarlier and will be slipped at Lyon from this express. Fandor was nonplussed. The essential was to follow Josephine ensconced in the compartment next to him. Well, I'll get into another carriage when we are off. It's so easy with the corridors. You can't do that, sir, insisted the guard. While all the carriages from our say in the front of the train communicate, this one is separated from them by a baggage car. Then I'll change later during the night. I have till Dijon, haven't I? You have. The guard went away. Fandor suddenly asked himself, Has Josephine made a mistake too? Or has she a definite purpose in being in a carriage which is to be slipped from the Southern Express at Dijon to go on towards the Swiss frontier? The guard was looking at tickets in Josephine's compartment. Fandor went near to listen. He heard the tale of a conversation between the fair traveller, her companion, and the guard. The latter declared as he withdrew, Exactly so. You shall not be disturbed. When Josephine had boarded the train, Fandor had not ventured to watch her too closely, nor the companion she had met on the platform at the last moment. He now decided to take advantage of the corridor to take a look at the man. He was quite stout, rather common in appearance, although with a prosperous air, a man of middle age whose jolly face was framed in a beard, giving him the look of an old mariner. Moreover, he was one-eyed. Josephine was playful, full of smiles and amiability, but also somewhat absent-minded. The pair had decidedly the appearance of being lovers. Although it was quite early, passengers were arranging to pass the night as comfortably as possible. The lamps had been shaded, with their little blue curtains and the portieres facing the corridors had been drawn. Fandor returned to his compartment. Two corners of it were already occupied, the two furthest away from the corridor. One was in possession of a man about forty, with a waxed moustache, having the air of an officer in mufti. The other was taken by a young collegian with a waxen complexion. The journalist determined to keep awake, but scarcely had he settled himself when drowsiness crept over him. Rocked by the regular motion of the train, he sank into a slumber troubled by nightmares. Then suddenly he sprang up. He had the clear impression of someone brushing by him and opening the door to the corridor. Who is there? he murmured in a voice thick with sleep and drowned by the rush of the train. No one answered him. He staggered out into the corridor. At the far end of the carriage, a passenger with a long black beard was standing smoking a cigar and apparently studying the murky country. Not a sound came from Josephine's apartment. With a shrug of his shoulders and cursing his fears, Fandor returned to his own seat. Why should he fancy, because he was following Josephine, that all the passengers in the train were cutthroats and accomplices of Lupart's mistress? Yet five minutes after these sage reflections, Fandor started again. He had distinctly seen, passing along the corridor, two fellows with villainous faces and suspicious demeanor. One of them cast into Fandor's compartment such a murderous glance that it made the journalist's heart palpitate. Fandor glanced at his companions. The officer was sleeping soundly, but the young fellow, although keeping perfectly still, opened his eyes from time to time and cast uneasy glances about him, then pretended to sleep as soon as he caught Fandor watching him. The train slackened speed. They were entering the Laroche station. There was a stop to change engines. The officer suddenly awoke and got out. The compartment holding Josephine and her companion was thrown open, and strange to say his neighbor, the collegian, had moved into it, sitting just opposite the stout gentleman. Fandor, with a view to keeping awake, abandoned his comfortable seat and settled himself in one of the hammocks in the corridor. He chose the one just opposite Josephine's door. But so great was his weariness that he quickly fell into a deep sleep. Suddenly a violent shock sent him rolling to the cross-seat in Josephine's compartment. As he picked himself up in a dazed condition, a cry of terror broke from his lips. Three inches from his head was the muzzle of a revolver held by a big ruffian wearing a mask who cried, Hands up, all! 
Fandor and his companions were too amazed to immediately obey, and the command came again more forcible. Hands up, and don't stir, or I'll blow out your brains. And now a gnome-like individual appeared, also masked. The first one turned to Josephine. You, woman, out of here. Without betraying by her expression whether or no she was his accomplice, Josephine hurriedly left her place, and slipping between the gnome and the colossus, went and cowered down at the end of the carriage. "'Go on,' suddenly commanded the big ruffian, who seemed to be the leader. "'Go on, rifle him. The gnome, with wonderful adroitness, ransacked the coat and waistcoat pockets of the traveller. The stout man, shaking with alarm, made no resistance. After relieving him of his watch and pocket-book, they forced him to undo his shirt. Around his waist he wore a broad leather belt. "'Go it, Beaumont! Relieve him of his burden, the fat jackass!' From the body of the traveller, the stolen belt passed to the big masked robber, who weighed the prize complacently. The belt contained pockets stuffed with gold and banknotes. The two robbers then moved away toward the further end of the carriage. Fandor, furious at being tricked like the simplest of greenhorns, determined to seize the occasion to give the alarm. The emergency bell was immediately above the pale-faced collegian. With a bound, the journalist sprang for it, but fell back with a loud cry as he felt a sharp pain in his hand. The collegian had leaped up and cruelly bitten his finger. So great was the pain that Fandor swooned for a few seconds, and that gave his assailant time to cross the compartment and reach the corridor. At this moment the express slackened its speed and slowly came to a standstill. "'Is it too high to jump?' Fandor knew the voice. It was Josephine's. "'No,' answered someone. "'Let yourself go. I'll catch you.' The sound of heavy shoes on the footboard told him that the robbers were making off. Josephine went with them, so she was their accomplice. The journalist sprang into the corridor to rush in pursuit, but he recoiled. A shot rang out, the glass fell broken before him, and a bullet flattened above his head in the woodwork. It now seemed to him that the train was gradually gathering way again. Fandor put his head through the broken glass and searched the darkness outside. Ah! he cried in amazement. There was no longer a train on the track, or rather, the main body of the train was vanishing in the distance, while the carriage in which he was and the rear baggage car had pulled up. Apparently the robbers had broken the couplings. At the moment the stout man, having quite recovered, drew near Fandor and observed the situation. "'Why, we're backing, we're backing!' he bellowed with alarm. "'Naturally, we're going down a slope,' calmly replied Fandor. The other groaned and wrung his hands. "'It's appalling! The Simplon Express is only twelve minutes behind us!' Fandor now realized the frightful danger. Without delay he made for the carriage door, ready to jump and risk breaking his bones, rather than face the terrible crash which seemed inevitable. But before he could make up his mind to the leap, a grinding noise became audible. The guard and the baggage car had applied the Westinghouse brakes, and in a few moments they came to a stop. Fandor and the stout gentleman sprang frantically out of the carriage, and two brakemen jumped from the baggage car, crying, Get away! Save yourselves! Clambering over the ties, they jumped a hedge, floundered in a hole full of water, scratching their hands and tearing their clothes. They rolled down a grassy slope, stuck in a ploughed field, then dropped to the ground motionless as a fearful din burst like thunder on the hush of the night. The Simplon Express, racing at full speed, had crashed into the two carriages left in the rails and smashed them to bits, while the engine and forward carriages of the train were telescoped. End of chapter 13